Good day and welcome to the next interview of LFS 2021. Uh, joining us today is Dr. Helen Holmes. If I got that surname correct, Holmes. Excellent. So Helen is a lecturer in sociology at the University of Manchester. Helen, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, and so um, where, are we, where are we calling you from today? You say you're in... Uh, I'm in sunny Rossendale in Lancashire. Sunny Rossendale. Well, you're only saying that because I'm in Bahrain and it is, we, were, we were discussing the different uh, weather and climate before, so um, I think Helen's a little bit jealous today, but I'm trying to keep it shtum. It's t terrible weather here today. Um, so Helen... Obviously, the theme of LFS 2021 is ethics um, or the ethics of consumption, the role of consumption within the various uh, themes or the prevailing conversations in fashion at the moment, uh, sustainability, uh, modern slavery and circular economy. Now, I know from my research that uh, uh, a lot of your research and a lot of your work is in, uh, is in circular economy. Can you just kind of give us a quick few minutes about how you came into this space. Uh, yeah, definitely. So uh, probably quite a strange uh, entrance into that space. I've always been interested in consumption. My PhD, strangely, was on hairdressing and I spent 12 months working in a hair salon. Um, so during that time, I was very interested in uh, the hair salon as a space of work, but mm -hmm. also as a space of consumption. Uh, and with the material of hair as well. So a lot of my work is focused on um, materiality and material culture. So quite a anthropological uh, sense as well. Um, so I became interested in the space of, space of consumption of the hair salon that then transferred into thinking of other spaces of consumption. And then more broadly, when thinking about consumption, I started to think about different forms of economy as well and different diverse forms of economy, um, including circular economy, but also sharing economy. Uh, and I've done quite a lot of work on community economies as well, which some of my work on uh, thrift feeds into too. Ah, uh, okay. Just a quick question. What So what was it that drew you to um, the, the hair salon as a space then? Um, well, I was originally, my PhD was actually originally going to be on gossiping and bitching. And I thought the hair salon would be a great space to do that in. But then when I began my PhD, I realised there was a lot of other really interesting things going on in there, particularly around um, the hairdresser as, as a, a craft uh, worker yeah. and also the actual materiality of hair, as well as this sort of pseudo living um, object, which became really interesting. So it, I was then become more interested in the space of consumption of hair itself and working with hair. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And I think um, obviously we're going to release this and I imagine COVID will still be um, a pandemic around the world and all of us are crying out for hairdressers at the moment, aren't we? I certainly am. I need a, I need a, definitely need a barber. But you just mentioned, um, uh, com what was it, communities of sharing or community sharing then. I've never yeah. heard that phrase. So community economies is a, a quite a, a big field, actually, and it's quite um, encompasses lots of other different forms of economy that we could think of. But a lot of my thrift work explored um, lots of third sector organisations and ad hoc groups um, and things like clothes swaps, which is where most of my um, fashion research uh, sits. Uh, and I became very interested in the sorts of things that went on within those really small sort of everyday micro practices of consumption and micro practices of the economy as well so that's where the circle economy the sharing economy thinking about redistribution markets um came in so yeah it was uh, the community economy thing is very broad though right okay yeah and I, I i do this is the main thing i really want to talk to you about today and it is all about all your work on on thrifting there's there's something i don't know for me probably that macklemore song um, I can't remember what it's called. it must be called thrift shop or something but there's something quite attractive about the word or about the the language use of the word thrift rather than 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 secondhand but talk to me about the um because I did read some of your research talk to me about the intersection that you found between thrift um and value 
Yeah, so this was a core um, a core piece that came out of the, the the my fellowship was on thrift, which I've completed now. We've sort of moved on into so some other things uh, related, um, but a, a core piece that came out of that was around thinking about how people value something as as um, an act of thrift or a practice of thrift. Mm. Uh, so part of the study. Um, involved all sorts of different data collection uh, methods and participants. So I work with different community economies. I also um, did 30 participant household interviews, which included a bit of a, a quantitative survey about the sorts of activities they got involved in. And what I tried to do was then sum up how these different activities, which were all badged as thrift, when you started to unpick them, actually had these quite different uh, values associated with them. So um, in the this particular paper, and it's one in the Sociological Review, not to plug my own work, um, but it always helps. Um, <laughs> it's broken down into into sort of a, a spectrum um, of uh, three different uh, three different aspects. So one is that people might thrift out of necessity, and indeed the etymology around thrift is around necessity and more around financial resources and saving resources. So people might be thrifty because they absolutely have to be; they've got no choice. Um, but they also may be thrifty for um, more conscientious reasons, and those could be um, ethical reasons, so around ethical consumption. They could be more around um, environmental and sustainability reasons, so, you know, wanting to consume uh, less or wanting to make the best use of the things that they've got, got and exhaust the value out of, out of the, the things that they have. Yeah. And it could also be around more around um, health reasons too, so... I spoke to quite a lot of um, parents who were very keen on um, their conscientious side was ensuring that their children uh, ate well, you know, and that there was a there was a health aspect to that as well. Or perhaps, you know, they wanted to shop local because they thought the, the produce would be um, would be of a better quality and, and more healthy, etc. And then the final one, and this is the one I think which is the hardest one to pin down that's sort of less tangible, is um, enjoyment that people would thrift for, not just for necessity or for for um, conscience uh, reasons and all these things overlap, but also out of enjoyment. So mm. there was lots of people who actually really enjoyed darning, um, you know, and that made that item last longer, or they really enjoyed um, knitting or um, making birthday cards out of old birthday cards that they cut up. So it, it was yeah. it was those sorts of things which we, I couldn't, were harder to sort of pin down, but the, the enjoyment factor was definitely there. Uh, and people found a value in that enjoyment as well. And, you know, you could say it was a, it was a hobby for them, that, that aspect of thrift was a, was a, a hobby, um, a hobby for them and something that they, they did because they wanted to, as well as needing to do it and doing it for environmental reasons as well. Yeah, that is, that's really interesting. I mean, one, one of the, one of the questions I do want to ask you was, within your research, was there any sort of clear segmentation of characteristics or groups of people that were leaning more towards the um, enjoyment aspects of thrift or the conscience aspects of thrift? Um, yes and no. So I think we typically saw that those who um, perhaps had more time um, would be more on the enjoyment factor. So those who had, you know, perhaps were retired um, and were not having to balance, you know, a 30, 40 hour week with looking after a small family, a young family as well would be, would be those who were probably more on the enjoyment side. But then you could also see the enjoyment factor coming out for those that were also doing it out of necessity. So they might actually enjoy some of the cooking or the meal preparation that they were doing, not all of it. I think that would be quite a stretch. Um, but that even those that, you know, perhaps didn't have the time and didn't see it as a hobby as well, found enjoyment in some of the practices or found enjoyment in saving money as well by, by being, you know, uh, cautious and thrifty with, with the resources that they had. So, yeah, the enjoyment's a difficult one, but I think we can sort of, and there's literature there as well, I can't think who at the minute, but the, of the more hobby aspect being related to those who have got more time and perhaps, you know, middle-class pursuits, et cetera. But then the, the paper does talk about it being more of a, you can see that enjoyment in in you know for other people as well and other groups yeah and i i, I think there's a there's a curiousness for me on the other side of the actual things that are thrifted so to speak because um i don't i don't know whether um this is shared uh, this is a shared belief but there's something or there used to be something a little bit icky about something that was second hand but 
anything that was vintage or antique was like, oh, oh, hello. There's so there's there's a we're at, we're it, it, they are the same thing. They are older or used or um, otherwise not new or unowned products. But by the label that we give them, we we see them in in different ways as well. At, at what at what point? I don't know. This is a genuine question. At what point does something go from being secondhand to being vintage? Well, good point there. There is a there's a great paper. I don't know if you're ready. It's by my my PhD supervisor Nikki Gregson and Louise Crew. It's called Bejorn Again or, or uh, by and it's in the um what's it in. I can't remember, but it was in the 90s that they wrote this paper and it's all about charity shop purchases and how um, you are not allowed to give underwear to a charity shop, but um, people do charity shops and people will buy vintage underwear. So again, it's that whole labeling of what's classed as and that value around around something that's given this label um, as vintage. I can't really answer that, but what I would say about the second hand um, idea is part of my course um, we talk about um, it's, it's on alternative economies and ordinary economies. It's a, a third year sociology course. We talk about gift giving and yeah. whether um, so I do a little poll as to whether the students would um, what they think about receiving a second hand gift or something that somebody has made. Uh, and it's interesting how um, I, I think perceptions around second hand and around handmade things as well are really changing uh, yeah. and that there's something Almost, especially around something that's handmade by someone it's seen as quite a special gift um, but it depends who's giving it to you as well so if it's a someone you barely know when they've made you something then you're probably a bit like um but if it's your, your best friend or you know a family member and they've gone out to the trouble of making you something that they think is really you know pertinent to you then um then it's much more likely to be accepted and, and, and wanted and welcome really so i do think perceptions are changing um perhaps not so much around uh, secondhand in terms of gifts but certainly around handmade gifts but I do think secondhand has become um become a lot more cool I'd say is uh is perhaps the way to put it yeah I I I, I would tend to agree as well and um we we do we do some work with Oxfam so um um they'll be made up to hear that and I'm definitely made up to hear that and I think I don't know is it a generational thing is it now is it now groovy to be um, involved with secondhand clothes and shopping in charity shops I don't know I think there's possibly a, a, a generational ele element to it so thinking back to the, the projects on thrift the participants who um, were older and we also is issued a, a mass observation directive and I won't go into what mass obs is but you can google it if you want to um, and we'd sort of argue I think or I would argue that those who were over 50 during the the project were much more of that thrifty mentality because they'd been brought up um by parents who'd lived through wars mm. or you know had been close to living through wartime or post-war austerity um and and they would have been almost championing um thrifty behaviors and would be it would be ingrained part of not everybody not, i don't want to stereotype or generalize but an ingrained more of an ingrained practice Whereas the likes of uh, probably me and you, who were sort of, um, you know, sort of born from sort of 70s, maybe onwards, it was not. But I think it's definitely becoming more of a an accepted practice now. And I know if you just look at the number, I only know from my clothes swap research, I'm sorry, there's somebody shouting in the background now. Um, uh, the the um, number of clothes swaps which are happening now in, in different cities or they were before the pandemic has, has grown massively and a lot of those are around university and campus areas areas you know so that there are more sort of young people attending and it is it's a trendy thing to do to get involved in a, in a clothes swap um for, is, for all varying reasons is that though um is this a provocative question? I'm not really too sure. It's not meant to be, but it might come across. Yeah, you're all right. Is that, are those thrift shops, uh, you know, mainly around university, sorry, clothes swaps around university campuses, are they a symptom of conscience, enjoyment, or financial necessity? Um, I'd say it's probably a bit of all three. Yeah. Um, I think the sustainability factor is probably bigger than it's ever been. And I would argue that that if we look at generationally, and again, I, you know, I can't set, turn around and say that my data, I've got uh, quantitative data to show this. Yeah. But the old generation are probably 
um, would do something and the, the motivation behind doing it would be more around saving money. Um, it may not necessarily, but often is, but not necessarily about sustainability, where the younger generation, I think, are much more focused on perhaps in engaging in a close what because it is more sustainable to, you know, and you want something new rather than going out and buying brand new, you get something that's new to you by going to a close walk. So I think there is that. And I think we can also say that something like a close off is almost like the the jumble sales of the noughties. You know, it's it's uh, the 2010s, whatever you want to call it. But um, when when do you hear of a jumble sale now? You just don't, do you? They just don't exist. No. So no, yeah, we in Liverpool we used to call them um, uh, car boot sales. Yep, there's still quite a few car boots. I think I think that's um, oh, they, that's they do different things. Yeah, that still happens. But the jumble sale was always the closed one where you'd go to, I don't know, a school hall and there'd be... Um, oh, yeah, know. of course it was. And someone yeah. was doing the tombola. Yeah. Which is like that big bingo thing and you won prizes. Yeah, yeah I remember that. It's all come back to me now. <laughs> um, okay, Helen, Helen you, you've, you've been wonderful. I just have one, one more question, if I may, and I hope we're doing all right for time. Um, so I know you've done um, a lot of work on thrifting. Um, how, how, how important a role do you think it plays or it could play in solving let, let's let's stay away from fashion because i don't want to tie you down too much in that because i know your research is a little bit wider but what role does thrifting play or what size of role does thrifting play in trying to address environmental and, and social issues because it, it can't be the answer can it um, no, but I think it can be part of the solution. Um, and um, I follow, I don't know whether anyone's heard of Jen Gale on um, on Facebook and on a few other places. And she always yeah. talks about making small changes to have a bigger impact. And I think the mentality of thrift can do that. Um, when we think about thrift as being, you know, something that is for um, sustainability reasons or conscious reasons and for necessity. But I think we need to sort of think about thrift in the inner in a bigger context. And I think often too much on, on, um, onus is put on and responsibility is put on the consumer when actually we need to be looking further up the up the supply chain um, to, to really make a big difference. And that's where I think, you know, my work on circle economy and circle economy principles uh, really comes in because circle economy is generally or started life as a, an industrial idea, uh, an industrial notion that sort of weaved itself down through um, various means such as the Ellen Carth MacArthur Foundation's brilliant work that they do and, and RAP, Waste Resources and Action Partnership, looking at how we can put those circular economy principles into businesses at all levels, yeah. so um, SMEs, but then also thinking about circular economy at the individual level as well, which is a bit harder to do, um, but I think it's thinking about that that bigger picture and where we can make differences uh, across across all levels but I think thrift is a place to start um from mm -hmm. certainly from an individual perspective and thinking about thrift broadly as well as not just something that's about financial necessity yeah yeah as you say turn it into a bit of a hobby I mean we've we've got some luxury brands delving into this circular economy space now as well haven't we how, how do you how do you see that progressing in the next five years is it is it a form of greenwashing or whitewashing at the moment? Well, I was going to say that that is one of my biggest concerns. And I know various other people of other academics have written about um, the greenwashing aspects of circular economy. Um, and I think we do need to be a little bit careful that this isn't about circular economy for yet more growth. It's yeah. about circular economy to try and use the resources that we we already have um, uh, and, and doing so in a in a in the most you know efficient and sustainable way um but yeah i would argue that you know it's something it's a bandwagon isn't it that that uh is getting jumped on a little bit now um by all different yeah. uh, sectors and industries and we maybe just need to approach that with caution uh if we can yeah keep our eyes open and our ears to the ground yeah helen you've been wonderful i've really enjoyed this and i'm sure everyone who see this will enjoy it too so thank you for your time and um, best wishes to you and your family during this crazy, crazy time in history. And to you. Thank you.